תגיד לנו כשאתה מוכן. מוכן? אוקיי, פליס, כבר. Okay, uh, I'd, I'd like to start with just a little bit of biography that will illuminate some of my interest in this topic and, and the way I approach it. Uh, my, uh, my father was a, uh, a Baptist uh, minister in rural New Brunswick. Uh, I uh, grew up in a thoroughly fundamentalist uh, church. Uh, this was Canadian fundamentalism, which is kinder and gentler than American fundamentalism, not <coughs> tied up in uh, nasty politics in quite the same way that American churches are. Uh, many of my uh, close friends came from uh, families where the parents did not have uh, high school educations. Uh, there was no one in my uh, church with a college degree um, and so on. Uh, my father had a Bible school education. And the community itself uh, w was in what is sometimes referred to as Canada's uh, Bible Belt, a very conservative, largely evangelical with a smattering of, of Catholic churches. Um, so a very, uh, very, very traditional kind of old-fashioned uh, farming, salt-of-the-earth uh, community. Uh, and uh, as a part of growing up in that community, I naturally imbibe fundamentalism. Uh, when, when I was a teenager, I was interested in sports and girls and those things. But I was also unusually interested in, uh, in, in Christian apologetics and, and I got pulled into, uh, into creationism. And I read widely in creationist literature and I became uh, convinced that young earth creationism uh, was was true, and my goal in going off to college was to become a uh, protagonist for the creationist cause. And uh, I, uh, th there were no uh, Christian colleges in uh, New Brunswick for me to attend. I ended up at Eastern Nazarene College in Boston, which, which I didn't really know anything about. Uh, it's a different denomination. Uh, turns out it was a, a somewhat liberal evangelical uh, college and it was consistently challenging to my fundamentalism and in fact it, the, the Wesleyan tradition of which it was a part uh, kind of defined itself to some degree kind of over against fundamentalism and, and kind of pushed back constantly on that. Just uh, a few examples. I'm not very familiar with the variations. The yeah, so the, it, the uh, I mean there's so much diversity in Protestant Christianity that it's, it's very hard hard to kind of speak in generalities, but uh, the, the more liberal part of the Wesleyan uh, tradition uh, is strongly influenced by Anglicanism, which has a very uh, Catholic traditional epistemology in which scripture is central but not exclusive. Uh, and so the position of scripture was not inerrantist, uh, for example, which I was uncomfortable with that because I had been raised uh, with uh, inerrancy, uh, and there was a recognition that one had to pay attention to the entire Christian tradition and not just the portion that began with Martin Luther, which was how I uh, was, I mean, like, I literally grew up, I'd never heard of the Nicene Creed, like, I went to college, I'd never heard the Nicene Creed, I'd never heard the Apostles' Creed, just those were Catholic things, not in the Bible, why would you bother with them? I mean, we read the Bible, the sermons came from the Bible, there was nothing Except the scriptures to guide uh, to guide theology uh, at uh, at Eastern Nazarene College, the approach was much broader, and I was horrified to discover that uh, that my uh, biblical literature teacher believed that there were multiple authors of the Book of Genesis, Wellhausen, and uh, <coughs> and, and so on. Uh, it was 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 taught there. Uh, I was horrified that the biology department taught uh, evolution, that the theology department didn't see his historicity of Adam and Eve as being particularly important, uh, and so on. And so dis despite these being, it was, despite it being a, a sort of moderately conservative evangelical uh, tradition, it was still very liberal for me. Uh, and I wrestled with it and, and sort of pushed back quite hard uh, against uh, against that, uh, and my, uh, my my the highlight of my freshman year was uh, meeting my hero uh, Henry Morris, who had started the scientific creationist movement in the states and had written some of the books that I had read, 
Uh, I met him at a church seminar and uh, told him I was studying physics and wanted to get a PhD and how could I get involved in his cause. And so he uh, signed my copy of his book and told me to contact him as soon as I was finished with my PhD and he'd be very interested in uh, seeing if he could find uh, something for me to do uh, working in the creationist cause at, at his uh, new uh, Institute for Creation Research that he had started at, uh, at Christian Heritage College in San Diego. Uh, and that was a college which I almost attended if it hadn't been so, I mean, you, uh, San Diego was as far away from New Brunswick, Canada as you can get and still be in North America. Uh, so uh, I, I couldn't quite imagine going there. So, uh, so I anticipated becoming a, a credentialed creationist and joining the noble cause of overturning the conspiracy that had delivered the materialistic theory of evolution to society. Uh, and this lasted uh, for for three semesters and in my fourth semester uh, when I was taking my first philosophy class it kind of all came crumbling apart. I, I, the, the particular worldview that undergirds young earth creationism is, is, is very brittle. There's, there's very little room to kind of grow in any direction and so uh, the typical situation, if, if you've taken it seriously, is that it kind of shatters uh, on you. It doesn't kind of evolve into something uh, something different. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was a crisis for me to, to deal with that and in some ways uh, it, it launched a, a, a lifelong sort of wrestling with, uh, with questions of, of faith. Um, so, so a lot of, a lot of my uh, work in trying to kind of understand creationism has, has come uh, in part from sort of trying to understand myself in a way, like trying to look back and say, okay, I was, uh, I was 19 years old, I was in college, I was majoring in physics and math and, you know, I mean, I, I, was, I was smart enough to know better uh, and yet somehow I had been pulled thoroughly into this worldview. Why was it so compelling? Like, what, what was it about this uh, view of the world that was totally separate from science that made it so attractive that you I could be pulled into question. it? Why did you decide to uh, major in uh, physics uh, as the uh, discipline that would give you inside a degree? Well, I mean, you'll probably appreciate this, but like, I found it really hard to kind of memorize all of that stuff that was in the cell in biology. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I always found that when I was taking a physics exam, you could kind of know two or three things and derive everything else that you needed, and that so seemed the much easier. Are, are the lazy yes. Lazy. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. It's like, yeah. It's like philosophers. Like philosophers. <laughs> oh, I agree. I mean, other subjects are just too hard for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that literally... It's more fundamental than I ever had in my life. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so my thought, my thought was just that, that the, the credential would, would sort of uh, would get me there, and the physics would be the one that would be the, probably the easiest uh, for me. Uh, you did get your PhD in physics? Yeah, so I did get my PhD in, in physics, uh, uh, in atomic physics. Atomic yeah. right. I work with some of the same people that... Uh, that the gym works with at, at Rice. Uh, we have some mutual acquaintances oh, okay. uh, there. Uh, so, uh, so in, in in approaching this subject, uh, I, I I've brought a kind of uh, personal interest uh, to it because the problem that I see was once embodied in myself, uh, and uh, my. My writing on this, I've, 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 I've written a lot of stuff about, uh, about science and religion, but my writing on this kind of fits into two parts. Like the, the, my, my, the first phase of my writing was to try and correct the misunderstandings and to try to move people uh, toward a more uh, sort of welcome embrace of science. Uh, it seemed to me, I was optimistic as a young scholar, that, that this should be possible, uh, especially uh, as I kind of became a, an academic within the Nazarene tradition which wasn't fundamentalist. I thought, okay, the, without that fundamentalist commitment we should be able to move 
uh, move forward. Clarification. Uh, yeah. it, it, the word fundamentalism is now just a, a pejorative, whereas you know it started in the early 20th century yeah. as an attempt to be ecumenical amongst Christians. What are the fundamental things that all Christians agree on? Mm -hmm. um, and it was attacked by uh, Fostick um, as uh, because Fostick rejected the notion of uh, even the possibility of a virtue. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to comment about oh, that in okay, a minute. Sorry, in a minute. Yeah. So I mean, it's it, it's kind of come to mean the uh, biblical literalism is would be the central, uh, probably theological commitment uh, now. Um, you so so many, new, many graduations. Uh, uh, yes, and there so are, ahead, uh, and, and there are. It's it's fascinating. <laughs> it's fascinating to watch uh, Ken Ham and Hugh Ross argue with each other about who's the better literalist when they <laughs> when they hold opposite views. <laughs> Uh, yes, who can be more literal? Well, yeah. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so, so it, initially, I was optimistic that with with some effort, you could uh, convince people that uh, that this creationist worldview was wrong. Uh, the The second half of my career has been writing about why you can't do that. Uh, I I kind of became pessimistic that that the the uh, the forces that kind of keep fundamentalism and creationism uh, intact are so strong in America that trying to move people out of that is uh, kind of impossible on a very large uh, scale. It's a new strong force. Yes, it's a new strong force. It's a new strong <laughs> force. Uh, so so that's, that's kind of what I wanted to, uh, to talk about. So I've, I've in the in the years since I've been involved in this, and and there's I mean there's lots and lots of people who ha, have been doing what I've been doing, uh, and so on there. But things are getting worse, not better. I mean we, we we don't have we don't have fewer young Earth creationists in the United States now than we did 30 years ago. Really? Anyone made the survey? Yeah, there's a survey. There's a, yeah, there's a survey done uh, every two years by the Gallup organization, and and the very very steady uh, commitment of something like like four, forty percent of the country uh, say that that uh, God created human beings in yes. essentially their present form a few thousand years but ago. Is it broken according to ages. Uh, yes, it, it's broken somewhat according to ages, but. It's always difficult to know what twenty-somethings will believe when they're forty-something. No, but, but it's meaning. You said like forty percent of the twenty years old believe that. No, no. I'm saying that they, the 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 poll is done just randomly, right? Uh, and the poll results in 2017 are the same as the poll results in uh, uh, in 1980. Right, so it's almost hard to believe. yes, it is. I mean, it, it, it's it's so difficult to believe that that a lot of people kind of just don't believe it, uh, and I mean, it, it reflects an extraordinary diversity in the United States, uh, but it also reflects a, a kind of uh, interesting division that that the uh, what used to be you know the fundamentalist uh, movement, the broader evangelical movement, uh, is in many ways. Disengaged from kind of larger intellectual and cultural conversations, so so much of this is invisible. Like a, lo a lot of these uh, people that are involved in this, they have uh, private schools that they go to, and they go to colleges that reinforce these beliefs. And so they 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 live in certain areas, they go to certain churches, they send their children to these kinds of schools, they listen to these radio stations, these television so stations, uh, and so on. And there's, there's a whole sort of broad supportive culture that somebody who lives in Boston would just be like completely unaware of. You, completely you unaware of. still find it in New England. We also have a yeah. vice president and a secretary of education who are anti-evolutionists and are supporting funding for private schools. Taking, yes. Funding that is, should, is is being taken away from public education. And and what you face in a lot of these these churches, I, I went to one with a boyfriend in high school, um, is they actually start dictating what music you're allowed to listen to, what television but shows you're. But anyone listens to that? I, I, I they, understand they, they, that the older people, the teachers, try to impose anything. But is it is there any way to? You cannot block information now. But but people who I ended up dumping the guy. Um, it, it's he, he earnestly felt that it was sinful 
to partake in I like to listen to Sting. And um, but but it was the wrong kind of music. <laughs> and and so with this growing up in the if you don't listen to the right things, if you don't watch the right things, you're going to contaminate your soul. They take it to heart. They don't say, oh, let's contaminate our souls and, you know. And, and listen to rock and roll. interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, I mean I'll, I'll give you one example. I mean, the, the book that I uploaded online, The Anointed, uh, there, like, there's, there's a chapter uh, near the end uh, in that called uh, A Carnival of Christians. Uh, th and that, that chronicles the life of a young man that I met at at Gordon College, uh, which is a, an evangelical school, but not a fundamentalist school uh, in, in Boston. He was a college senior, so he was 22 years old. Uh, he, he had never had in his entire life a secular friend. He'd never yeah. had a meaningful relationship with somebody who wasn't also a Christian like him. He grew up in a housing development that was mostly all Baptist. Uh, his neighbors were Baptists. He went to a preschool at his Baptist church. He went to private Baptist schools. Uh, he worked for uh, Baptist employers uh, and so on. He went to a Christian college and so on. And here he is, 22 years old, and ha has lived his entire life in a uh, cocoon of evangelical Christianity. Uh, he subscribed to magazines that reinforced this view. He, there was a, a, a TV stations with programs on them for young people like this. Uh, radio stations. He was tempted to watch other television or to read other books or to subscribe to other magazines. Oh, I mean, he, he, he read those other things and so on. But, but in terms of his, the people that he came in contact with, uh, they were all uh, evangelical Christians Jesus just, just, the will go to Bnebrak, just like him. Something very similar, yeah. a Jewish thing, but, but it doesn't hold. Meaning young people are exposed to the outside world, you cannot prevent it. You cannot. Uh, but, but, but. What, what about uh, 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 ultra orthodox? That's what Christians. we'll see. We'll see this afternoon, we'll have a tour, and you'll, be, you'll get the impression yourself. All right, but uh, I won't see the uh, the, um, the inner human uh, aspect. This you'll see in Barilande. You saw. They're coming here. They cross the street and they come here, and it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. But how do they? Sure. Uh, um, but they are more mixed up uh, with you. Uh, I mean, Rowley describes himself as modern Orthodox, and uh, in this hierarchy of Jewish, uh, how would you describe yourself? No, who knows? But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just myself. <laughs> But, uh, no, you're clearly yeah. Jewish. I see the yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Jewish. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but you'll see, I'm, as far as society goes, I'm involved in many societies. What Carl is talking about the social, the, so, the, the, yes. the, the yes. social atmosphere, not the personal yeah. atmosphere, right? But yeah. but it's it's a mistake though. It's, it's it's a mistake to view this as a kind of cloistered, separate world. I mean, it it's, it it isn't sort of physically separated. There, there is so much that is produced by this broad evangelical culture that it, it, it's simply that if, if your parents kind of just encourage you in these directions, there are, there's so much opportunity for you to read things that reinforce what you uh, have been taught at home. Uh, so many leaders, so many intellectuals promoting this uh, and so on, that, that you can kind of be fully aware. I mean, you can be fully aware that there is a theory of evolution and lots of people in the secular academy believe that, but you've got huge organizations over here with, with PhDs on their staff writing books uh, and so on, explaining why you don't need to accept that. I mean, we have, we have organizations like uh, Ken Ham's Answers in Genesis. I mean, that, that organization spends $20 million a year. I mean, that's a lot of money. $20 million a year producing uh, media that's intended to keep people from accepting evolution. 
and they they uh, sell all kinds of uh, of Sunday school videos and and booklets for children, coloring books. You can get uh, games for your preschool children, like if a three-year-old can have a puzzle that will be uh, Noah's Ark or something like that, that, that kind of bring them into this way uh, of thinking. Uh, and so, and so you, don't, you don't have to sort of hide your child from this. You just have to kind of deliver the information in the right way, and it just reinforces the way that they're growing up, and they will, be, uh, they will just be comfortable. Uh, with that. Ark amusement park he's up, can't handle. That's right. I mean, there's, there's a new, uh, I think he spent $80 million or something on that, a, a brand new amusement park with a full, full scale model of Noah's Ark, you know, showing how Noah could have managed this complicated project uh, with just a small number of people and so on. There's uh, elephants in there on treadmills, that, which was how they handled the waste, right? So you have an elephant walking on a treadmill all day long and buckets of. Uh, Manure and so on that that, that that are going being dumped overboard. Uh, uh, hired special effects people who are on par with this film. Yeah. To, 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 for the I mean, the same some of the same people that designed Universal Studios worked on his Creation Museum, and it's a and cool problem to solve. It's just not a righteous problem to solve. He's been setting up displays at the Hilton Hotel in in Waco on during um, the parent visitation weekend to protest Baylor for teaching evolution. And he has these displays in the hotel and hits the parents right as they walk out of the rooms. Yeah. I mean, it's, and, and he's just one organization. I mean, the Discovery Institute spends uh, in excess of $10 million a year uh, attacking evolution. Uh, there's still an Institute for Creation Research, which I think is in Texas now. Uh, that does this in lots of smaller organizations, uh, so, so much so that, that now the Republican Party has kind of embraced this anti-science view and most people that want to run for president on the Republican ticket kind of need to at least pay lip service to this. There was a, a, an amazing moment uh, in the 2012 election when there were some 10 or 12 uh, candidates who wanted to run for the Republican ticket, and they were in a debate, and, and the, uh, the interviewer asked them, how many of you accept Darwin's theory of evolution? And only one hand went up. This was the 16 one, right? So this is no, I think this was 12, but uh, uh, well, it was Huntsman. Huntsman was in. Was Huntsman? Uh, Huntsman wasn't in this last go around. No, he was not in. I think it was 2012. Yeah. Uh, and 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 he disappeared like three or four days later. He dropped out because his poll numbers uh, his poll numbers were so bad. People uh, serious. Oh, absolutely serious. I mean, and and see, and your response, like, uh, to be kind of incredulous, like this, like this is the way a, a typical. Boston intellectual would respond to this because like you like you could find it in New England I mean there's a few s schools that are, that teach this private schools but it's it's practically invisible uh, but if you go down south you find it and you and you don't and you don't find it only in Christian enclaves I mean, uh, 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 and all of society builds itself around it we have these crazy things called beer barns because people are so ashamed to let their neighbors know that they buy alcohol, that we have alcohol stores that you drive into, your car is completely hidden while you're in there. They load the alcohol in your car and then you drive away. It's the, the amount of shame that people feel. It's, I also had a fundamentalist upbringing. And it was only my mother. My father was very much a, a scholar of the Bible and tolerated my mother's fundamentalism, but he wasn't the one that was home all day. Um, you, it's this entire indoctrination and there's shame involved. Um, we had friends that believed that playing cards was a sin. And, and when you were 20, you took it seriously? Yeah, oh, I didn't. No, I didn't take it seriously ever because luckily my dad was a scholar and a theologian. But your friends took it seriously. I didn't make friends with those people, which gave me a smaller. But I was also a nerdy, super nerdy child, so I was weird. All of my friends were people that wanted to like catch bugs and see what happened. But I, I knew the people that, that, 
they fully embraced this. And, and I encountered them in Bible studies in college where they, <coughs> the argument I mentioned to a couple of people a few days ago was like I had this, this other graduate student trying to explain to me that uh, Neanderthal skeletons are just the humans that lived to be hundreds of years old from the Old Testament that as they lived older and older, their skeleton changed. Yeah. And, and they were without souls, too, the claim is. And so they, they, fe they, they found a way to rewrite the world to fit into this very strange paradigm. The, these, these parents were also afraid of colleges. There was an article that yeah. just came out a couple months ago uh, discussing the dangers of college to, to, to their children. I teach in the yeah. summers, I teach, an intro, I teach intro to history of science to a group of uh, Haredi students that are part of a program to incorporate them in the higher educational system, which they don't have the background for, so they go through three semesters of uh, getting their juries. Crash cases, yes. It's a crash course, getting them up to par, and part of that, they inserted a history of science course, which is good for me, because uh, young, young PhD getting to teach, and, and the people are amazing, uh, and and their stories are amazingly similar to this. Um, yes, so they are very open. They're not seriously so some of them. By this. So so there's the whole spectrum. Some of them are wide-eyed, boggled by the, the the new things that they see, and some of them were disenchanted with this scheme of things when they were inside, and so this is what they were waiting for. So there's the whole there's a whole spectrum yeah, of reactions. And, and they all listen. And, and this is also, it leads to strange dichotomies in the church. When, when I was an undergraduate, um, I was going to a Reformed Baptist church. And at one point, I was, I was talking to the pastor about something. And um, he, he made a comment that when people get married in that particular church, they actually encourage them to hold the ceremony elsewhere if they're a reformed person like I am, so it doesn't insult the belief systems of the more conservative members of the church. So even the pastors are taking actions even when they understand and believe in evolution and in science and that the Bible doesn't say anything about not dancing, um, that, that rather than harm the fragile faith of some of the members, that they will ask the more open to actually reading what's in the Bible members to, to go elsewhere for some of their celebrations. I, I, I grew up with sort of Baptist background. I grew up in Alaska, so I didn't really see much of the cultural things. I mean, well. You probably didn't see very many human beings, right? <laughs> yeah. They made, they, uh, you know, I mean, I, three things that I remember hearing the Baptists were against was, was drinking, dancing, and card like yeah. But I mean, I mean, my my parents would play, and, and I mean, my parents were very much teetotaler. They'd probably be shocked if they found that I drink an occasional wine. I'm still <laughs> strong. I <laughs> don't tell them. You know, really. But but it was yeah, it, when I went to William Joe College, which is a, a, a liberal arts, you know, Baptist college. That one one issue that was protest among the students was they were allowed to dance in the in in, in the fraternity houses off campus, but there was no dancing allowed on campus. So the the protests were basically holding dances on campus. Yeah. We also have a yeah. college for which the president does not allow al alcohol officially on campuses, but was promoting guns in dormitories. Yes. Yeah. That, that contradiction you can't is drink a, real a gun. Thing. Yes, this, 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 this has made uh, strange <laughs> bedfellows, hasn't it? <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's the the Bible doesn't uh, ban if you guns. Take guns anywhere. Anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing <laughs> said in the Bible about guns. guns. The mix, the mix is dangerous. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Guns were promoted when the president was giving. A talk at a chapel service. Well, yeah, I, I don't. We've kind of derailed you, so you I'm have yet to that. But <coughs> may I? Yes. Make an, okay. Yeah. A couple of quick yeah. things. One, the United States is now 16 percent Latino. 16 percent <coughs> Latino. Um, so not all of the social dynamics are what you might have in mind. So a lot of people coming from Latin America, they're going to be anti-evolution as well. But Catholics? Well, no, no, no. Uh, most of the Latinos coming in are evangelical. Really? Yeah. Yes. But there is, in a lot of the mindset, evolution is part of Marxism, part of atheism. 
they kind of travel together a, a yeah. lot of times. And so, yeah. right. and to be fair, new, new atheism hasn't helped this because um, yeah. but both sides have played this. Yeah. Yes, uh, both sides have played These are all things I, I mean, I'm, yeah. I want to kind of put this all in a kind of package then here. Then there is, yeah. uh, the bit that probably, that most of us miss too is evolution is actually hard to learn and to accept because it runs counter to our natural intuitions. And there's actually research on this yeah. too. That even children who are brought up in sort of enthusiastic atheist homes actually don't start showing that they're getting it and believing it until they're pretty old. It takes a lot of work to teach atheism because it runs against intuitions about like begets like and kind essentialism and things like that. And deep time is really hard. So there's some natural, it's not just sort of cultural structures, but Carl's done a nice job pointing at it. These are, these are also cultural complexes that then ride on these. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, that's that, so, yeah. so, total social phenomena, not only evolution. Yeah, no, I mean, so I, I'm, that's, that's, that's what I'm getting. Yeah, I'm, I'm, Go ahead. Yeah, I kind of want to make the make that point. I mean, so so the, the, the point that I want to make here, kind of the one thing that I want to share is that I, in, in th having thought about this for several years, I, I'm convinced that that the United States is is a kind of unique incubator for anti-intellectualism. That that there's a kind of a synergy between different things that have made it worse in the United States than uh, in other places. Uh, I, I don't think there's anything unique in the United States, but I think there's a kind of constellation of of things going on that give anti-intellectualism an extraordinary power. And I mean, by, and by anti-intellectualism, I don't mean like a preference for stupidity. I mean, this is a kind of a, uh, an uneasiness about, about sort of deferring to elites on, uh, on questions and just letting kind of intellectuals uh, tell you uh, what you should think. So, so what, what, I, what I think has, has synergized in, in the United States uh, to, to give anti-intellectualism its power is, is a combination of, of three things. Uh, the, the way that America was born and, and the sort of uh, cultural developments in the, in the first uh, century resulted in a kind of a, a great celebration of of kind of every man. I mean, there's there's a kind of belief in the United States that that heroes are always ordinary uh, people, and some of the first heroes to emerge in American culture were people like uh, like Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett and so on. Uh, I mean, these are they're celebrated uh, stories where I mean children read novels about them and there are movies and so on uh, about them. Uh, and so on. No, I mean these these are people that wear uh, a, a hat made from a beaver or a coon. Uh, they have a long gun. They they travel by themselves through the woods, shooting food, shooting Indians, building log cabins, uh, and so on. I mean th these are heroic uh, figures, and and this this model of kind of the ordinary hero who just through his own uh, sort of uh, his own ordinary powers, like achieves great things, is 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 a recurring motif. I mean, it's it's what Hollywood does constantly. I mean, Clint Eastwood made a whole long hero, a, a, a entire career out of playing uh, the the sort of loner who solves problems on his own and so on. And uh, and and so the the notion of the cowboy, you know, listen in, in Saving Darwin, I finished my chapter on this by saying like America is a nation that loves cowboys. And cowboys don't need intellectuals telling them what to think uh, there. And so, so there is this sense that, that, uh, that uh, there's something grand in the power of an ordinary person, the brave loner who can solve problems uh, uh, on his own. Uh, so I think, I think this kind of celebration of every man uh, is, is an important part of American culture. Uh, I also think that the way that Protestantism took root in America has created uh, additional uh, support for this way of thinking. That uh, the the history of America is mainly the history of uh, of Protestantism, and, and Catholicism comes uh, comes later. Uh, John Kennedy was the first Catholic uh, president in the United States. The the, the particular way that Protestantism took root uh, involved a, a, a kind of uh, 
piety where we're faithfully reading the Bible and praying and attending church uh, and, and so on uh, came to define what it meant to be a, a good Christian. Uh, and there, was a, the, there wasn't an, an, an assault on expertise and, and learning. It just was, was secondary. And so, so a great many, and this is true even today, a great many people that are uh, ministers and pastors uh, go to a Bible school for their education. So they, they may go to a Bible school for two years or three years and, and study nothing but the Bible in English. So they, they can't speak Hebrew, they can't speak Greek, they don't know about the Christian tradition, they don't learn anything about ancient Near Eastern culture, but they just learn like just all the stuff in the Bible and how, how it with all zero fits. Context. Uh, That's yes, so yes, with, 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 zero with no context. So of scripture. That's right. I mean, it's kind of sola scriptura, but it, but in a way that goes way beyond what Luther would have approved of uh, there. Uh, and so this notion, and, and I grew up very much with this. That that I mean, the typical way that you would study the Bible would would be that you you'd have a group of people around a table, and you would just read a passage, and and people would say, well. To me, this means this, and someone else would say, "Well, I think to me it means this," and these meanings are all kind of okay, and the Holy Spirit is kind of guiding everyone into truth, and the notion that you might need to have a commentary written by a Hebrew scholar to help you with this—that's a foreign notion. Uh, that just an ordinary English reading of the Bible, uh, guided by the Holy Spirit, is all you need to get the right theology. And, and, and Ken Ham, you can find Ken Ham on YouTube stating this exact thing. I mean, he brags about the fact that I just read the Bible. I, he says, I don't interpret it. That's a quote. I don't interpret the Bible. I just read it. It's, it's, it that's it's when you interpret it that you get into trouble. And so if, if a Hebrew scholar comes in and suggests something other than the ordinary English reading, uh, then he rejects that as this, this, is, this is an interpretation, I'm just reading it. And so he reads the story in Genesis about it, days, it, it, and he knows what a day is, it's 24 hours, hours long. How does he deal with the statement that uh, whenever you translate a work from one language to, the, to another, no, you're the Holy Spirit it. guided the translation. Exactly. That's, yeah. But the, how do you, how do you okay. counter the statement that, uh, are you sure that it's not Satan that's uh, guiding the translation? So, so, it will be. I, I have heard <laughs> the most amazing argument over you should be using the new revised standard translation, international, NVIS, whatever those words are, uh, because it is the most inspired of the modern translations, and to use any other translation is to be lit, led astray. And churches in England believe that King James Version was inspired, right? Well, yeah, I think yeah. King James. Yeah. 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 King James. Southern Baptist, and it's King James yeah. that was inspired. Yeah, the yeah, King. The, yeah, the King James. I mean, uh, the, there was a church in my community where the pastor had hung a, a very large sign across the front of the church that said. King James Version only. That was all they would read there. And, and they, they had arguments that like God had guided the translators uh, and that's why this one was, was better than the new ones because in, inevitably they would have become, in, have become invested in some particular nuance that was different in a new translation and so that would make the new translation wrong there. And then, and then th there was actually a lot of wailing and gnashing of teeth when it was suggested that King James may have been a homosexual. And people thought, oh, what does this mean about the veracity of the King James Version of the they Bible? He translated the Bible, uh, actually. So, uh, yeah, so. I believe that King James translated the Bible. No, but, but, he, but he was in charge of the project, and his name, was, uh, his name was on it. And if he's a homosexual, we can't have that. Uh, it was unique. It's the only one that has the, all the synonyms all go to the same word. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and then the, the third, the third and, and, and final element, I think, in this is, um, is the influence of the philosophy that was known as common sense realism uh, that w was very influential in the United States. Uh, this, was, this is a secular movement, not, not religion. And so, so these, these things kind of resonate and, and mutually uh, support each other. But, but common sense realism uh, uh, was Thomas Jefferson's uh, philosophy, and it, 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 it guided much of the thinking through the 19th century. And it's, and it's, it, it's again, an, it's not 
a celebration of, of stupidity or, or lack of knowledge, but it's just a statement that kind of, like the, the ordinary understanding of the world is, is the right one, that, that you, you don't need to kind of abstract and dig and find hidden truths kind of behind the world, that you can just kind of encounter it directly. And so it, it, in, it, in Ken Ham's case, it kind of translates, so I can just read it in English and I can understand it. Uh, in uh, 19th century uh, science in, in America, the, the emphasis was on, was on practical applications and technology and kind of building uh, the Industrial Revolution and so on. Uh, and, uh, it's also the Holy Spirit guiding, you know? Yes, and, and, the, the, and the Holy Spirit... If the Holy Spirit guides, you don't have to dig. I'm not yeah. trying to be cynical. No, I mean, that's the, I mean and, that, and that's something that you hear very, very often. Yes. Uh, to, today, if you can turn on uh, a television down south and you can hear a preacher, like, it's sometimes even like closing his eyes right on camera. Yet, what, what is that God? And then he'll, he'll repeat yeah. just what, what the Holy Spirit just revealed to him in that moment. Well, uh, and what's interesting is, did you see the research that James Randi did on, I forget exactly which one of the televised um, big churches where they do healings in the church. Yeah, I, I saw that. He, he installed a radio scanner, and it turned out that the pastor's wife was going through the crowd beforehand and shaking hands and talking to people, and then throughout the church service was talking over radio into an earpiece he had hidden in his ear and saying, uh, fifth row, person in the yellow shirt, has this ailment, and then you go, the Lord has told me you have a hip problem. And he would then claim to heal them, but it was really the power of suggestion. Yeah. You know, and this that, was exploiting that. that retired for yeah. about 10 years, and then he yeah. came back, yeah. and he yeah. became as popular before. Yeah. Okay. So, so all, 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 all of this kind of worked relatively uh, peacefully through the first 150 years of the American uh, experiment. Uh, but by the beginning of the 20th century, and the Scopes trial is kind of maybe the signature window into kind of this, uh, this conflict, but uh, there was the biblical scholarship from Germany, the, the higher criticism uh, of the scriptures and so on. There was uh, theological modernism in which uh, Christian ministers were ceasing to believe in miracles and the virgin birth and resurrection and, uh, and so on. And a, a, whole, a whole set of challenges were emerging so that it, it, be, it began to look like this conservative evangelical worldview wasn't dominant any longer. I mean, the, the great universities in, in America were, were like all up until, up until Cornell was founded in the 19th century. They were all religious institutions. Uh, so there was a sense that like this is our nation. Our nation holds the, this conservative evangelical worldview uh, and we can be kind of uh, secure that this defines America. So this, this became ambiguous at the beginning of the 20th century, whether this would continue to define America or whether or not theological modernism, German higher criticism of the Bible, Darwin's theory of evolution and so on, these challenges, whether, whether these were going to uh, somehow dismantle the uh, evangelical foundations. And so, so the movement that Frank alluded to, uh, to earlier uh, called uh, fundamentalism, uh, emerged uh, in the uh, in the early part of the 19th century. I mean, it's, it's it's not a term that had any meaning in the 19th century. Uh, in in but in the early part of the 20th century, when you had Christian ministers saying, "The virgin birth is not true. Jesus did not rise from the dead. There is no eternal life." Uh, but hey, we can all be Christians anyway. Uh, you had people saying, "Well, that doesn't sound like Christianity to me." And so the fundamentalist movement was an attempt to say, "Well, like there have there have to be some fundamentals." that we uh, agree on, which are Christian. And without these, we're not Christian. And so the, uh, a series of, of uh, publications emerged, uh, funded by Texas oil men, uh, still, still the way that works, uh, 
and these were, these were published under the name the fundamentals and you can you can still buy them now it's interesting in in the fundamentals if you read if you read the uh, original books there, there's very little anti-evolution there so Dar Darwin wasn't yet a boogeyman and so this was mainly an attempt to defend against higher criticism and theological modernism uh, not against anything going on in science and so there was still a sense that that science may still be on our side uh, this comes to uh, a, a very public uh, head with with the Scopes trial uh, the Scopes trial is a part of the mythology now of, of America and there's I mean the, it, it, the, the view that most people have of what went on there is very very distorted uh, but, but the Scopes trial grew out of something that, that southern states were doing, which was passing laws prohibiting the teaching uh, of evolution, just making it illegal uh, to teach it. Now, the textbook that John Scopes used, which is sort of celebrated by the secular establishment as the truth, uh, well, it is is a terrible, terrible book. It has one Blacks small. Blacks are inferior. Yeah, it has. Life. Yeah, it has one small chapter on uh, on evolution, uh, in which it states very clearly that you can rank the races according to uh, their intellectual prowess, with the white Caucasian race at the top and the Aborigines and Native Americans and Blacks at the bottom, and so on. It encourages uh, eugenics, uh, laments that we can't simply exterminate the lower forms. Yes, but very, yes. And, uh, I might yes. want to mention that one of the reasons William Jennings Bryan was hostile to evolution is because uh, he perceived that it was racism that gave rise to the he, First World War. He thought that the Germans yeah. were motivated by racism, specifically claiming that um, blacks were inferior to whites. And he said that there was clear in the Bible we're all descended, blacks and whites, from Adam and Eve, therefore we're equal. Yeah. So 19, that's, 1919. A group of real Eastern establishment scientists wrote, uh, no, 1918, Woodrow Wilson was still in office in 1918. So it's 1918. There's a document that I saw, it's in Israel now, someone, uh, Professor Bauer has it from Hebrew University, uh, like 80 very respected scientists asked, uh, petitioned uh, President Wilson to uh, curb the immigration of lower races that will, yes. that yeah. because of eugenical yeah. reasons, yes. will, will be bad for, for American society. Well, and most. And Woodrow Wilson yeah. believed firmly that blacks were genetically inferior to whites, and uh, he uh, led a movement to expel as much as possible blacks from the federal government and uh, segregated uh, the military, which was, uh, I mean, he was, he was very much into this racism. And remember, William Jennings Bryan was his uh, Secretary, Secretary of, of State, State and played a major role in getting Wilson the nomination for the Democratic Party for president. So he knew Wilson's views, and he was in reaction against this. He says, well, if evolution tells us this nonsense, that it has to be wrong, let's get it out of the public schools. now." Being America, we can uh, not get it out of private schools. If, if Vanderbilt, who announced we're going to teach this evolution, whatever the um, uh, uh, government says, oh, that's fine. Vanderbilt is a private university. They can teach whatever they want. But we want this uh, racism nonsense, uh, which is the same as evolution, out of the public schools. And I'm very sympathetic to that view. I don't like uh, it, people being taught blacks are inferior to whites. Yeah, I mean, and I mean, it's a it's a sordid history in the United States at that point. And most most states, most of the states had eugenics clinics, and we we now know that uh, that sixty five si yeah six eugenics was science sixty five thousand American women were forcibly sterilized against their will because they were believed to be genetically inferior. 65,000. I mean, this wasn't, I mean. Well, and this continues yeah. in a sly way that what? doesn't get talked about very much. So, the way they do it now is there's a lot of inner city clinics that uh, basically, if a poor person, which is usually a black person, a, a poor woman, which is usually a black woman, uh, comes into the clinic, they uh, will pretty much insist on an IUD, which is an internal birth. Uh, no, yeah. Yeah. 
and um, it takes money to get those removed. Um, and it's almost impossible for a, a white affluent woman to get one. You have to argue with your practitioner. So, uh, so if we, if we move move forward to the middle of the twentieth century, this this is where where uh, anti science and anti intellectualism, I think, begin to seriously assert themselves. Uh, that for for much of the first half of the twentieth century, Christians were making peace with evolution. Uh, the neo-Darwinian synthesis had not yet occurred, so, so there wasn't this clear emphasis on randomness. And many people thought, well, we can just understand evolution as creation over time. This is acceptable theologically. Uh, the age of the Earth, P Christians were comfortable with the Earth being, uh, uh, being very ancient. They, uh, um, in six uh, days of forever, with the, the classic uh, um, original right. description of the, um, of the Scopes trial, um, a, a, far, a farmer who was on the jury in the Scopes trial was asked by a reporter, actually, what do you think of evolution? And he said, when I started uh, farming, um, area, ears of corn were about that long. Now they're this long. So do I believe in evolution? You better believe it. <laughs> <laughs> so in other yeah. words, it, I would argue that it is it's not counterintuitive. If you're a farmer and you deal with living things, you see living things change. Uh, <laughs> they don't always recognize that's what it is that they're seeing. So he was a smart one. Yeah. But people then say within a species. But yeah. So a little comment of um, the Big Bang Theory and genetics. Which were both invented by priests. Yeah. Both, both, were both condemned in the Soviet Union. So it's interesting. Um, in 1948, they said we must attack the Big Bang Theory. Uh, this is all they were told in Leningrad because it's encouraging the purging. Yeah. <laughs> so there's, a, there's another story. Uh, that was yes. At the yeah. Same time, yeah. I, I never so actually made that connection. But you know the statement that Pius the Twelfth gave a uh, uh, encyclical saying, "Aha, science confirms that." The yes, and I know. And the major yes. said, "Hold back." Yes. So yes. Stop that. But the bigger story is, he was enthusiastic. In uh, in atheist Soviet Union, it was condemned. No, 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 yeah. no, 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 yeah. no, no, no. Yeah. Uh, uh, what, what do you? Who oh, is the Big Bang was condemned in Russia. The oh, no. of the Pope. Pope oh, no, no, the major no, said to the Pope, uh, "Don't be over enthusiastic." And and Pius XII listened. Um, but but the bigger story here, of course, is that um, materialism was very threatened by by this and. Um, uh, so it's, it's another story that we don't get told very yeah. much. Mm. So I, I, Steve Weinberg, when I was taking the course from, in cosmology from him in I need the ten more late minutes. 60s, um, he said that uh, I was a, a uh, supporter of the um, steady state theory because mm. the steady state theory, in contrast to all other cosmological theories, least resembles the account yes. in Genesis. <laughs> it is refuted by <laughs> observation. <laughs> So, so uh, what, what's created the co contemporary uh, dynamic emerges in the middle of the century, in the, 19, the middle of the 20th century, 1960s. Uh, there's, there's a variety of things that happen. Uh, socially, it was becoming almost universal that children were going through to high school. So instead of quitting in the eighth grade and going to work on the farm, they were going through to high school, and so so evolution was being encountered by a lot broader swath of the uh, of the population. Uh, the neo-Darwinian synthesis had occurred, and the central role of random mutation uh, had had become dominant. Uh, the Sputnik launch in 1957, the the year I was born, uh, scared. American science uh, and a lot of federal dollars flowed into the revision of the science curriculum. Uh, and one of the major results of that was a new biology curriculum in which all the biology texts were, okay, in which all the biology texts were rewritten. Uh, and because this was after the neo-Darwinian synthesis, the, the, new, the new biology text had evolution as kind of the central organizing principle of the entire field, rather than a chapter in the back which you could kind of take or leave uh, in the 1960s. Uh, so, so evolution uh, is, is kind of pushed way closer to the front burner 
uh, as a result of this. And most importantly, it's the randomness which is at the center. Yes, and the, and the randomness is, is a central uh, part of this. So, so it was very difficult now at this point to kind of see evolution. It was, it was difficult to ignore it. It was also difficult to kind of see it as simply God's method of creation. It didn't look quite like that anymore. So, it, so in the 1960s, uh, Henry Morris, the my boyhood hero, uh, and an Old Testament scholar uh, wrote a very ambitious book uh, called The Genesis Flood, which, which I, I think that that's one of the most influential books in America in the 20th century. I mean, it's, it's, it would be hard to point to a single book which has a larger, has had a larger impact. Uh, Morris and Wickham in, were convinced that Christian thinkers had given up too quickly to Darwin, that they had just said, okay, every time some new pronouncement came out of the scientific community, okay, we'll work with that, we'll work with that, we'll work with that, uh, and that they had thrown out the baby and the bathwater uh, together, and they took aim at this concept of theistic evolution, uh, which most evangelicals uh, embraced at that point, uh, and said, this is not an appropriate Christian position, it doesn't have a good solid scientific foundation uh, and we capitulated too quickly we should have tried harder to build a scientific model that goes with Genesis and so they laid out the foundations for this in this big sprawling ambitious book the Genesis flood uh, stating that the earth was 10,000 years old and looking for scientific support for that uh, stating that uh, s evolution between species, uh, they used the biblical term kinds, which was ambiguous enough to be impossible to refute, uh, saying that no evolution between kinds, and so on, and, and absolute uniqueness of, of human beings, uh, and uh, presented this viewpoint. And this, this caught on the, uh, a, a wide range of positions that people held within evangelicalism kind of collapsed down into one and people became very, very attracted to this. Now, I was very attracted to this as, as a young person. I, mean, I read the book just a few years after it was written. The, the, the attraction was that, that you had a, a credentialed, he was Princeton educated Old Testament scholar saying that this is what Genesis means with ample references to the Hebrew and to, uh, to the cultural context in which it was written. This is what Genesis means. It, doesn't mean that these days are epochs uh, and so on. It means a literal seven-day creation. And then you had a scientist, and Henry Morris had a PhD. He had a position at a secular research university. He'd written a textbook, well-published. Uh, his expertise was in hydraulics, which is the relevant science to understand Noah's flood and so on. And so he lays out this whole picture of how if we look at the same data, the rock strata and so on, and if we suppose that all of this is the result of Noah's flood instead of billions of years of sedimentation and erosion and so on, uh, we can see that we get a much better picture and, and, you know, praise God, the science and the Bible come right together and give us exactly the same message. And so the Institute for Creation Research and its subsequent uh, organizations that it spawned, like Ken Ham's Answers in Genesis, took, took this approach that, that there's a, a scientific view and a biblical view, they match each other. Uh, in order to be faithful to the Bible, you have to believe this, and you can also be faithful to science and believe this. Now, I think when Henry Morris started this, he believed that it was going to be possible to do this. I mean, he set up a creation research center, hired credentialed people and tried to actually do research uh, on this. Uh, but of course the scientific evidence just grows and grows and grows that the earth is billions of years old, not thousands, that, uh, that evolution is true and so on. Uh, so, so it became necessary to develop a strategy to explain why it was that the pronouncements of the scientific community contradicted this view. I mean, if, if this view is true, why aren't scientists rallying to it? I mean, why can't you point to growing numbers of people, growing numbers of geologists that think the Earth is 10,000 years old? Uh, so what, what emerged was a, uh, an equation of science with materialism. And so the scientific community was repeatedly described, and, and this just appears 
constantly in the literature, repeatedly described as, as naturalistic, as atheistic, as starting with the assumption that there is no God and developing the best possible explanation given this starting assumption. And then Henry Morris would say, and we, but we know there is a God, and so shouldn't we take that into consideration? Shouldn't we allow that the existence of God might possibly matter in our understanding of the natural world? Now, this is a very attractive view to a Christian. In fact, every Christian would probably say, well, I suppose that since God exists, believing that that's true ought to shape your view of the natural world in some way, but the scientific community wouldn't have that, wouldn't hear of that. And so you, so you begin to uh, have a, a campaign, a consistent propaganda campaign to undermine the scientific community as driven by atheistic assumptions. And then this, this claim, which became ubiquitous in the crisis literature, becomes the rallying cry of Richard Dawkins and the New Atheists as well. So, so you have... He invited the reaction. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so you have these Christian fundamentalist leaders saying that the scientific community is intrinsically atheist, makes no use of the hypothesis of God, has, can explain everything without God, and then you have the public faces of the scientific community, yes. Richard Dawkins, Stephen Weinberg, and so on, saying, exactly right, that's exactly right. And so, so in a strange wedding, Ken Ham and Richard Dawkins are bedfellows, saying exactly the same thing. And, and uh, Philip Johnson, who's kind of the godfather of the intelligent design movement, like he, he even made a roadshow uh, out of this. There was a, a biologist at Cornell University named William Provine who said that you have to choose uh, between atheistic, materialistic uh, science and evolution uh, or God. And Philip Johnson says the exact same thing. And the two of them would go on the road and, and okay. debate. To debate. I mean, they were kind of friends in in some sense. But Philip Johnson wanted to make. I mean, he he wanted to make this point. I mean, he said that that the that science is not theologically neutral. Science is naturalistic. Uh, its conclusions uh, buttress uh, atheism and uh, leave no room for God. And he wanted people to understand that. And so, if he can get William Provine, a member of the scientific community, to say exactly the same thing, then the two of them can debate and make that, uh, make that crystal clear. And so, so now, now we have a situation where, where, where the, the American demographic that is influenced by the way this debate is structured uh, now see what comes out of the scientific community as kind of intrinsically threatening. Uh, there's a very popular book connecting Darwin to Hitler. Uh, Ken Ham has a very popular poster in which he says that, that Darwin's theory uh, is not just a scientific theory, it's, it's the foundation for a new social order. Uh, he blames Darwin for racism. He has this, this poster in which he kind of lays all this out in a kind of cartoon, it's a very entertaining way. But, uh, but uh, homosexuality is, is Darwin's fault, uh, abortion is Darwin's fault, drug uh, use, pornography, the breakup of the family, all these things are Darwin's fault, that if we had only stayed with Genesis, he calls his organization Answers in Genesis, if we had just stuck with Genesis, we would all be fine. But we went chasing after Darwin, and the result is the social order has disintegrated, and, uh, and here we are. I make a strong case as regards uh, um, Nazism as Darwinism, because they, the Nazis certainly thought so. The, uh, well, Richard Weikert, who wrote that book, certainly uh, certainly believes that. Uh, so, so that's where people are today. Now, now the way the way this plays into other things that we're interested in, like like big data, like climate change, and so on, is uh, this this demographic, which is which is not just a backwater in Alabama. I mean, this is you know, hundred million Americans are relatively f familiar with this kind of way of looking at the world. Uh, this, this is an audience which has already been told that you can't trust the scientific community. So if we have a new topic that's not really a part of the, the Christian controversy, uh, climate change, vaccinations, uh, and now big data, 
uh, and so on. I mean, these are all going to be the deliverances of genetic, a scientific yes. community genetic with engineering. genetic engineering and so on. I mean, so, so many different things. You can look at it, and, and you already have an audience which distrusts science. They're going to be very receptive to these uh, new views, and, and I can only imagine that, that if a, uh, if, if a left-leaning democratic administration used big data to try to do something to reform health care or give us self-driving cars or, or what, what have you, that it, it, it would be completely mistrusted because the scientific community is, is not a force uh, for good. Well, then you'll find someone to cooperate on the scientific community. Like you'll find a new document for new data. Yeah. It will say that new data proves there is no God, and that's it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. There is a, yeah. a division, political division in the United States, anyway, between which aspects of, uh, of uh, consensus science are accepted. Like, for example, there is far more suspicion of genetically modified organisms on uh, the left wing than there are on the right wing. Yes. Now, um, so in, 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 in vaccination, um, my brother, who is very much left-wing, um, is very suspicious of, of, of vaccination. And um, I, who are more right-wing, are completely happy with, uh, yeah. with vaccination. Yes. So, um, I mean, it depends yeah. on which particular issue in, quote, consensus science. And, uh, yeah. I, I can't yeah. tell you yeah. why. Yeah. I, I think, I, my understanding of I'm this, the, social, <laughs> the social phenomenon <laughs> is that the left distrusts government. So they say, the government cannot do anything. If, if you have genetic engineering tomatoes or, or corn, it's because big farmers trust, you know, the, the, the big companies want to make money and disregard your health. Vaccination comes from the drug companies that want to, to increase the profit. It's not an anti-scientific objection, it's an objection to business. Well, the, uh, the, the objection of the, of the right to genetic engineering is, is really a principle of destructive science. Well, the, the actual arguments that I have seen are do not uh, only incidentally involve the big companies and big pharma, that um, they're saying that um, the, um, there's, it, it, let, let me try. Uh, the vaccines cause autism. I mean, that's, that's the claim. That, that that's right. you, I mean, they believe that vaccinations cause autism. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, they disbelieve, the, uh, 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 they, they may bring in, uh, ha, big pharma is, is bribing doctors to uh, suppress the evidence, but the, but the, see, you can play this game both ways. You can have uh, remember um, the left tr distrusts the big companies, the right distrusts big government. So um, you can have <laughs> you have two big guys. If you have two big guys, you just disagree. On James, which big guys James, James has a question. Guy, right? Jim had a question. Yeah. Yeah, I, I haven't said a word, but I would like yeah. a few minutes to just comment on this. I haven't interrupted you at all. I feel like a child torn between a mother and father who are getting a divorce. Mm -hmm. I am in both of these communities. Mm -hmm. And I feel that this community is sitting here as if we really know what we're doing. And that other community is all wrong. The reason I think we need to look to ourselves as scientists, we need to look to ourselves. To say it's Ken Ham, it's that community, it's all about them, it's all their problem, and we know what's right, I think is, is a prescription for disaster. I sit between Christians and Jews all the time, and I love both communities, and I'm from both communities. And it bothers me when one community starts firing at the other, and the other at the one. This is exactly what's happening here, I think. We're all sitting around, oh, it's terrible what's happening. One of the reasons for the distrust from that community toward people like us at meetings just like this, where we sit around and act as if we really know stuff and we've got this thing right. I've written two articles on origin of life. Nobody has contested the scientific claims. It has nothing to do with God. It's all about life's origin based on the science. On my website, jmtour.com, on the, there's a tab on the right called Personal Topics. You go to Evolution Creation. I cite both of those articles there, and I'm coming out with a third article for a moratorium on origin of life research because there's so many lies in it. You make a little sort of thing, and you ex extrapolate to the point yep. where the, we really know where life came from to the point that everybody 
thinks scientists know. Scientists are utterly clueless. And because we lie, because scientists lie with their projections, and they have deceived generation after generation, and they promised delivery based upon this, and nothing has come in 66 years, two thirds of a century since Miller Urey. Nothing has come because they're all wrong on this thing. We How do come you know out with. Wrong? I mean, I mean, I said it legitimately. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. You yeah. make the claim that they're all wrong. All right, would you let me finish? Yeah. And then yeah. you can ask. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, yeah. but one of the reasons we know they're all wrong is because it's not leading anywhere. There's nothing there. Okay, so but because when they say we have made a protocell, we've made a protocell. Well, what is that? That is a lipid bilayer, that is a liposome. To have a cell, you have to have ionic membranes that are going to open that up. You need stuff inside it. You need to have proteins expressed all over this surface. You change the structure of one of them. Just one hexamer of mannose, one mannose hexamer can have over one trillion arrangements. Any one of these is wrong, that cell dies. None of this complexity is addressed and they complain and, and they, they suggest that they, they, they have a path to the origin of life. The projections, the projections that they make based on a small result, there is a distrust of scientists just like us from that community, and it is warranted based on some of the claims that we have made. We just heard the rabbi say in 1990, uh, 1919, a group of 80 scientists said that you know, they should restrict immigration of a certain types of people. So what do we do today? A group of 80 scientists petition the government and we go, whoa, they must be right. There's 80 scientists. 80 scientists can be very, very wrong about stuff. And we, we, we totally dismiss an organization. I can tell you what's happened to me because of my stance based solely upon the science that's been written based on origin of life is that, is that I have been excluded from getting grants. You say, oh, they wouldn't exclude you. Who would exclude you? I've had two federal officers come to me and say, you're not getting a grant from this organization. I like you, Jim, and I'm telling you what's happening. I had the Department of Defense, who I had funding for for years, 17 years of DARPA support. I mean, I'm well entrenched with Department of Defense funding. I had somebody come to me and tell me that please apply for a grant. The program manager asked for my proposal. I called him, I said, it wasn't funded. What happened? He says, it wasn't funded. Above him, this thing got hit. There is a calculated attack on people that come against the science. You say, oh, our community wouldn't do that. Well, wake up, your community does it. Two federal officers shut down my program. This is why I file lots of patents and I get support from independent industries. They try to shut me down. I don't do origin of life research. I'm just calling it like I see it. And, and I understand the chemistry. Origin of life is prebiotic. It is pure chemistry. I understand the science. I read the science. I signed a statement in 2001 that says that, that we are skeptical of random mutation and, and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. That came to me in a quick email. I signed that statement. I said, sure, I can agree with that. And as a result of that, I have been excluded from the National Academy of Science. This is the first time I'm saying it on record. And you say, how do I know? Because when I applied, they said to me, you will never get in the National Academy. I said, I've done as much as people getting in. You know what they said to me? You've done twice as much as people getting in. I have over 650 publications. I have lots of nature, lots of science publications. And I'm not in. Because they have said to me, you will not get in because you signed that statement. Now, I did a exhaustive study talking to, to, to geneticists and biologists explained to me evolution. Now they don't even believe in random mutation and natural selection accounting for the, for, for the complexity of life. They've switched to neutral drift, which is the change from a parent to a child, and they've switched to universal common descent. I said, well, why don't you then sign that statement with me? It is self-selecting. The National Academy is self-selecting. And so they keep people that are going to bring a contrary view to this. And this is this our great society that's, oh, we're right and that other 100 million people are wrong? No doubt. Why they, 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 don't, they distrust this community? Because we have little gatherings like this. And we come against them as if they're a bunch of blithering idiots. And they're not. I feel like a child torn between a mother and father who are, who are, who are fighting in a, in, in, a, in a divorce here. And I'm like saying, would you guys just get along? If you would understand where they're coming from, if you would tell them the truth, this is what we know. This is what 
This is our conjecture based on what we know. Rather than saying, this is what we know and that's the way it is, and if you argue with it, you're wrong because 80 scientists agree with this, or 99% of the National Academy, that 1% is old guys who got in there before this was an issue, and as soon as they die off, you will have complete unanimity in the National Academy of Science because the National Academy of Science is self-selecting. So this is what we're doing. This is an exact representation of what the scientific community is, and it's not going to get any better at this rate. I am calling for peace here. I am calling for an understanding here why these people doubt scientists. Why is this? Because we sit around like we in, in, in the Northeast, in Boston, and we really understand understand this and those idiots in the South don't understand this. Well, they're not stupid. Those Texas oil men have made a lot of money, not because they're stupid. You go out and try to make a lot of money. Go ahead, give it a try. It's not easy. They're not stupid, and, but when you start projecting, when we, our community, starts projecting that we know something and we are sure of it and we really don't know for sure, then it's a real problem. Some of the same people that were pushing global warming where 30 years ago, I know them, were pushing global cooling. The same people. So, of course, the community is going to have distrust here. What can I believe? You can't just jerk them around like this. You have to say, this is what we know about science, and this is our conjecture based on this. This is not fact. This is a theory of evolution. And there are real problems with evolution. And I list it on my website. I'm not saying that evolution is wrong. I can't prove that. How can I prove evolution is wrong? But what I can say is that you look at Project ENCODE, where they're finding in 98.5% of the human DNA that used to be called junk DNA, which is now called intergenic DNA, more, more accurately, we're finding lots of protein-coding genes that build the body that are unique not in the chimpanzee, but to humans. Same with orphan genes. And, and at first they say, well, there's only 100 or so of those. Now there's thousands. Every year there's more thousands being added. So you have to account for this. So of course, and I say exactly on my website, you shouldn't stop teaching evolution in school, but maybe what you want to do is teach universal common descent and ENCODE and orphan genes that they're still building a body of evidence and there's problems with this. It's not a fact yet. And that's what happens to the community, and you get isolation. And I love both of these communities, and I feel a part. But this community, the scientific community, is cutting off James Tour from scientific funding for my saying exactly what I'm saying now. And you may think yourself so tolerant and so wonderful that you would never do that, but that's exactly what the community is doing. And two federal officers that know me, have known me for years, came to me and told me, they said, we couldn't even write this to you. We didn't want to even tell you on the phone. But this is what's happening to you, and they're trying to shoot you down and close you down. And that's why I've gone to this industrial funding. And I still have had to cut down my group from 45 to 30, but I still have a group of 30, and it's industrially funded because they're trying to shut me down because I am coming out and saying, hey, guys, there are problems here. Let's not project above what we have. And let's embrace this community. If we would just reach out, and, and I go into churches, and I speak, and I try to reason with them, the scientific community, I say, they don't hate you. They don't hate you. They're not looking to destroy you. This is the sense that they get. And you sit in the community, think about this. If they had heard this conversation, if, if this film goes out, and you post this film, and they hear a bunch of scientists sitting around, speaking, bad-mouthing their community like this, you're going you're gonna to see people rise up and say, the heck with that community. We're going to vote people in office that are going to cut out your stinking research funds. You want to treat us like that? We'll cut out your, your research funds, and that's exactly what they're coming against. You wonder why research funding isn't going up? You wonder why there's all these Republicans being voted in that, that don't care at all about science? Well, wake up. It's because of us. It's because of what we say. It's because of what we do that we alienate this community and they'll vote in mass. And they'll put people in office that don't support us anymore and we'll be the ones responsible for it because we've shot this thing down. We've shot ourselves in the foot. We're the ones who've done it. Now, to your question, I don't know that they're all wrong. 
that I misspoke, but what I can say, and it's all my articles, I just say, you can't claim this, you can't claim this, you have extrapolated this to the understanding of how you know life has originated when you are not even close. You can't make the nucleic acids, you can't make the, 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 uh, the chiral uh, uh, carbohydrates, you can't make the chiral proteins, and then you want to have all these things assembled, and so from the chemical side, they're clueless. From the assembly side, there's very few people in the world that know how to build molecules and know how to assemble them into working systems. By what I, by what I mean very few, it's less than about 25 people in the world. I happen to be among that unique group that makes molecules and then assembles them into a functioning system. Both of those, those are the two areas within origin of life. Both of those systems are so way behind what they have projected. I will have another article, I'd be glad to send you a preprint where I'm calling for this moratorium where I, where I spell it out and I show example after example of the claim that was made based on what they found scientifically. So I hope I answered your question. I want to fully associate with uh, what Jim just said. Uh, I should mention that I'm also a signatory of the, that particular petition that got him into trouble. And I've been trying um, in a more delicate way um, to make the same points around here. I think that uh, you're using this term evolution in um, a different, in, in different ways. I mean, he makes the point that uh, um, I think we can justify if you limit the word evolution to mean common descent. But, um, to, um, but the word evolution also carries a connotation that, um, unless you make it very clear what you're talking about, can also mean just uh, evolution by Darwin methods, by um, um, natural selection acting on random mutations in which uh, there is uh, no really solid good evidence. And as he points out, the evolutionists themselves have uh, now um, rejected it. Um, so I think we have to be very careful in using our language, and as Jim said, we have to be very precise as scientists to distinguish between what we are projecting and what we actually know. So um, I am in full support of what Jim just said. Jim, do you want to ask you something? Uh, you described very well the state of what we know now. But I would like to ask you, without disregarding the communities, just yourself, James Turo, uh, would you change your opinion if there was a proof, if we could emulate, if we, we could make a cell in the lab? Would it change your mind about the whole issue of the origin of life? Well, if we, if we could make a Two cell... Two years, you'll make it. Okay, if we, if we could make a cell in the lab, but you, you have to qualify. So people have taken a genome that they've built. Right. They, they have a cell, they pull the genome out, they take the one that they made in. I have a Fiat, I take out the engine, no, and you I take put it, it into a scratch. Fork. You'll manage to make it from it, scratch. Yeah, if they manage to make it from scratch in a way that mimics what would be available on prebiotic earth. So right. you, you, you take hydrogen cyanide, you take formaldehyde, and you build this thing up, yeah, then I would say, hey, you guys have shown this thing. It really starts to look like, hey, these pieces could come together. Well, and still that you happen. think that faith is something else no, no, and it no, has no. nothing then, to then, do with the... No, no, if these guys have demonstrated this sort of thing, it would say, I'd say, hey, you guys really did it, and we might be able to do that in a hundred years. Right. We might be able to do that. It wouldn't shake my faith in God it's at all. nothing, exactly. Yeah, it wouldn't shake my faith in God because, because I believe in God because he came to me, he changed my life. I visit with him each day. There's, there's something there... My interpretation of the Bible is subject to change. My interpretation of science is subject to change. So, so I would say, hey, this describes how life could have originated. I would be the first to concede that if I saw it. So, and, it and, and if I saw it, it wouldn't shake my faith at all. So we still can be open, even though the evidence is lacking. And maybe it's wrong, but maybe it's right. So, so... Exactly. Your faith does not depend on this being right or wrong. Right, and it doesn't depend on, upon my interpretation of the book of Genesis. Because every time I talk to another scholar on Genesis, I get different views. Because they enlighten me with new things. My faith is not built just upon my interpretation of the book of Genesis. As a believer, but, my right. faith is, is, is soundly rooted in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's risen from the dead. 
this is what my faith is based on. So, and, and when you now let's go back to the okay. community. What do you think will will the community of 100 million Americans that you say should be embraced? Or what will be their reaction if scientists will be able to make to create life on a, a cell from scratch? Right, I, and I think their reaction, if people like me, who who they trust, would communicate to them. People have made, if I were to say people have made a cell in the lab from starting components that would be available on prebiotic earth, it looks like this could be a way. I don't think that they would mind at all. Y you, you know, they embrace me, even though I am entrenched in the hardcore sciences. They embrace me. They are willing to embrace us. They are willing to come up, uh, alongside us. I don't think it's going to shake them at so all. It's what they call the story and not the fact. The attitude and not the fact. Yeah, the attitude. The facts are not we, the problem. The attitude is them. the problem. And, and, and I can talk to a young earth creationist, and I have no problem with that. I have no problem with that. Okay. And I say, based on what you see, I don't come against you. To me, that's not a central issue. It's not a central issue at all. They're, if they want to get into science and do that, they'll figure out how to do These aren't stupid people. This doesn't inhibit my science, this doesn't inhibit your science and your string theory and your multiverses. I tell you, I, I have a lot of trouble understanding multiverses. I'm not a string theorist. Whether I accept a multiverse or this is the, this is the sole universe, I mean, it, it doesn't affect my science at all. And it doesn't affect them how I love you. And that's exactly the way they are. Now, if you were to come against me and say, you know, you're really a dummy if you don't accept multiverses based on what we know about string theory, then I'm going to start resisting you. And I, and I would never say and that. And you would never say that. You would never say that, but that's what we're doing with 100 million people. And I think there's a lot of commonality between that 100 million and your orthodox community here in Israel. There's, there, there's, there's commonality a, a, a amongst them. I don't think so. You don't think so? No, I don't think so, because I think that... Uh, they move to the new state. We'll discuss it later. Okay. But uh, I agree with you 100% that your interpretation of Genesis should not affect your faith at all. doesn't affect my faith at all. I, I, I'm constantly enlightened on new interpretations. I mean, you taught me things last night about Pharaoh that I never really thought about, that he viewed, he viewed Moses as coming and doing a bunch of black magic. Why should he succumb to somebody who does black magic in front of him? Why should he say, take my property? I never considered this from Pharaoh's view. I needed this Jewish rabbi to, to have me consider the Egyptians' view. <laughs> there's, one point. there's one point of this is that when people say evolution, that, we, that, that okay, the scientific evidence, if they say that scientific evidence is strong for evolution, that that's taken to mean that we have strong evolution for uh, evidence for how life originated. I mean, is is, yeah, is, the, is that the, confusion? The, the, a, yes, a the two have become conflated. Most scientists don't even know the difference between evolution and origin of life. They are clearly different. One is prebiotic, one is biotic, and even science professors. I had an evolutionary biologist in my university say to me, one or two months ago. Jim, you know I don't agree with you on any of this stuff that you've just written. Well, the whole article was on origin of life. I said, so you, you're talking about origin of life? Or you're talking about evolution? He had conflated the two. This was even an evolutionary biologist who conflated the two. Most scientists don't even know the difference. They all think it's one and the same. They don't know how far we are in origin of life. Origin of life is in an embryonic stage relative to where evolution is. So if we just made it more, if we say, okay, there's strong evidence for biological evolution, meaning, you know, afterlife, if, if, but, but are, are you saying, yeah, no, no, oh, what's that word, abiotic evolution? Yeah, what, 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 what I would well, say. Well, I mean, I, mean, I was going to go on Darwinism to say. Darwinism or directed evolution, that's like a huge difference. And, but it can uh, be inclusive. It can be, or, but uh, but uh, it's never presented that way. It's always presented. Well, I wouldn't say never. I presented in favor. Well, <laughs> yes, but that's where, uh, yes, yes. Well, uh, at least for one step. But right, it, right, right, right. right. So, so, so what that? I say <laughs> is universal common descent has a lot going for it. If you right. study yes. that theory, there are a lot of convergent facts going well right. for universal common descent. But then, but then I, yes, but then I, and that's what I say on my website. I mean, you go ahead, teach universal common descent, 
but then bring in the problems. The problems for universal common descent are Project ENCODE. This is not a Christian organization. This is a U.S. government-funded effort that's looking at the intergenic DNA. Orphan genes. And show that there is not unanimity on this, even among scientists, because I'll tell you, there's a, there are other scientists like me that actually agree with me that are afraid to speak up because they've seen what happens to me. And this is silencing of a community. Most organic chemists who really understand what it takes to build a molecule, not biologists, biologists never build a molecule, they buy a kit, and they, most organic chemists actually in the back room, they agree with me. They say, Jim, you're right. We, we, we are absolutely clueless on this origin of life stuff. These no. people, yeah, now. They say we're absolutely clueless. We don't understand what these people are saying. And that's what they say in the back room. I have sat, I sat with a National Academy winner and a Nobel Prize winner. I said, do you understand this? Do you understand this? You know what they said? Nothing. Because when they're together, they won't speak up. They just stared at me. They didn't understand it. They just stared at me. But when I get them alone, they tell me, I agree. I was just at, I was at Weissman Institute talking with a biophysicist. He was talking about the ear. There's a bar in the ear that vibrates, but the stiffness of that bar changes. The modulus changes as you go along. It's a tremendous, tremendous uh, 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 feature here that allows us to hear all these tonal differences. And he's describing his research to me. And I said, how do you think something like that evolves? Give me a picture for that, how that would evolve. You know what he said to me? He says, oh, Jim, we all believe evolution, but we have no idea how it happens. This is what they tell me in the back room. This is the confession from the biophysicist at the Weizmann Institute. We all believe in evolution, but we have no idea how it happens. It takes a good Jewish man to express it like this. But this is what I'm saying. So, only in, so private. only in private, but in public. When I start challenging people in public, they get very angry with me. As soon as I enter a lecture room, the whole tone of their presentation changes because they're going to be very careful about their extrapolations in front of me. Why should it be that way? It seems, like the, the, it seems like a problem is when on either side we are seeing lack of knowledge one way or the other and searching for it in the future as God of the gaps. That when we, if we don't understand it, it means that God did it in a way that we want to do to give God credit for it rather than the holistic view of we will learn. We will learn how, in some sense, God did it. It's, the God of the gaps won't work, and I think yeah. that's a problem. On yeah, I, I never speak but, God of the no, gaps, not, and, and, and I say in my article, I say in my articles, one day we'll know, w one day we may know, but it's far from today. Yeah. I'm, I'm not saying yeah. you are. I'm saying okay. that general attitude. It yeah. seems like that can fit into it. Um, to, and, uh, of course, because from if, both sides God, God, if you believe in God of the gaps, then you shouldn't study because you minimize God. And that's not what Jim is saying. No, I'm not saying he is. I'm just saying that, that sometimes that is. But is that, is, is, that, is, that part, it, is that part of why maybe scientists don't recognize, I mean, you're saying that people are not admitting the gaps. And are they not admitting the gaps because they think that Christians will then, or, well, I shouldn't restrict it to Christians, but, it, any, but the, the theists or whatever will, will, will say now, okay, ah, this is a gap that, that only God can fill. I mean, are they afraid of, that their atheist position is getting reduced if there are more gaps? Is that's, that that's what I'm saying. It can be misused on both sides. Or yeah, misunderstood. yeah. It is misused on both okay. sides. Yeah, yeah. But let me, let me, uh, let me I mean, I, I'd like to kind of applaud what you're saying. I mean, I, th I think that, uh, that that you're completely right. And I mean, what what has happened it, to, to Jim is like, it's, it's very widespread. I mean, even, you know, Stephen Jay Gould, as famous as he was, like he didn't believe that gradualistic evolution worked and he had a punctuated equilibrium model that he proposed instead and and his comments about in which he was critiquing the received wisdom about how Darwinism works and suggesting something else so his comments critiquing uh, evolution are, are picked up by the anti-evolutionists and then used to try to attack evolution in general and and once again be careful about this word evolution because um, yeah, I mean, so we, we, we yeah, we, yeah, 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 no, we, 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 we know we're talking quotes, about you know, the, Yeah, we know. <laughs> without, without doing it with his yeah. fingers. <laughs> but, it, but it's, I mean, it's, it's a very, it's a very highly charged political environment where, where if you, if you make a comment that the anti-evolutionists can use, 
they will use that and then you will appear to be on their side. Robert Wright wrote a piece called The Accidental Creationist about Stephen Jay Gould. Well, I mean, Stephen Jay Gould was very opposed to creationism, but he didn't think the standard Darwinian picture was right. And I mean, I'm sure that you are called a creationist probably in the circles that are trying to keep you out of the National Academy, uh, when in fact you're not. You're just trying to say, let's not well, make I, claims I, I, I about science that I'm, aren't I'm, true. I never said I'm not. I mean, yeah. That's right. It's kind of what the word yeah. creationist means, right? Can, can I just uh, say, 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 yeah, say sure. I, think, I think you do make a good point because I know in the UK, um, global warming, I think in lots of countries, is now regarded as a religion by many people. And so any questioning is regarded as, 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 as you don't believe in it. So, I mean, I know a very good scientist in the UK who believes that um, the world is warming, he believes that carbon dioxide is going up, but he says carbon dioxide is not the main reason for global warming, it's water vapour, and uh, you know, reducing carbon dioxide will not have any effect on global warming because the water vapour is going up. He's tried to get his paper published, and this man's a fellow of the Royal Society right already, he probably wouldn't be now, right? and, and, and he, he gets rejected by the editors of the journal before it reaches referees, right? Because they regard him as, as um, uh, as, as a denier of global warming, which is not. And so th there is this sort of fundamentalist view in, in, in other areas, and clearly in your area, yeah, where it's actually difficult word, to uh, question. I, I'm called the uh, yeah. global warming denier. Yeah, because okay. again, I don't think that um, humans are uh, responsible uh, for the, the observed global warming. And, and uh, I might also uh, mention uh, another distinguished uh, member of our community, um, <laughs> Freeman Dyson yes. uh, mm. is also equally uh, suspicious mm. of, uh, mm. of the models. Mm. He thinks that the system is just yeah. too complex yeah. to be able to say yeah. what the cause is. Yes. Now, I'm even more of a, uh, a skeptic uh, than Freeman Dyson because I've looked carefully into the actual data, mm. and I think that it's been manipulated. Mm. I don't think mm. I trust the data mm. anymore. Mm. I think they're making claims about the data which are not justified. Mm. Um, <laughs> so for this reason, I'm even <laughs> suspicious of whether we've seen yes. global warming. Yes. I tend to believe the, the satellites yeah, more, yeah. but they only go back to, seven, to 1979. And I have a reason okay, yeah. for thinking that the yeah. uh, a bias in favor of faking the data is eliminated mm -hmm. from that, mm -hmm. mainly because the people who are analyzing the data have no control over the satellite itself. Right. They're just using yes. publicly available yes. data, which mm -hmm. they're then analyzing. And there, I do know there are two main groups, one of which is a I'll call it anthropomorphic global warming skeptic group, mm -hmm. and another one which is a pro. Um, um, anthropomorphic so uh, bias each other. Though. Yes, mm -hmm. but they get mm -hmm. the same results. Mm -hmm. uh, they, but, they completely. Uh, yeah. That's why I, I trust it yeah. because I, I, you have I, two I, different I, groups I, with opposite biases, and I know what their biases are, and you get the same answer. Yes. Aha! <laughs> I can probably trust that. Also, I know how the mechanisms work, mm -hmm. um, how the uh, the actual data is taken. So I, I trust it for that mm -hmm. reason too. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, scientists need to be humble, and this is, many global warming protagonists are not humble, right? They're quite arrogant people, and there's certain humility which we need to get in. And, and we need to have open inquiry, which you know, has been closed down with you, and it's closed down in many cases with global warming as well. It doesn't help to have, say anyone who is a global warming uh, skeptic should be put in prison. And no. uh, there are claims of that, public mm -hmm. claims. So I think that um, uh, Jeb's comment, uh, which is, I think, directed um, mm. to us, I think it's very much uh, 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 a good point. Yes. Mm. Mm. I mean, we have to very watch ourselves and be very careful in our language and what we mean by these and say anyone who disagrees with us um, uh, any, even slightly is anti-science. I mean, I disagree with my two colleagues here <laughs> on quantum gravity, but I don't think they're anti-science. I, I think I'm right, of course, but they have a similar <laughs> view of their views. And uh, we are all agreed by debate. We'll find out in the end who's right, but probably none of us. <laughs> One question I wanted to ask you, though. You, you Thank were, you so say, much. You were, you were suggesting more yes. yes. You were suggesting more uh, we'll or we'll just, just research. We'll do this in the recess. We'll take a, a five-minute uh, break, and then we'll hear Aviram. Okay? Yeah. So, 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 so